everyone. Wow, I've got some. Hello, Atlanta. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy to be here, especially without a mask. I feel, uh, I feel naked up on the stage. Uh, the one thing I promised I'd start off with, by the way, it's really hard to hear myself. Uh, <laughs> can, you turn, can you turn everyone else down? Thanks. Um, anyway, uh, Jared Mursky was up earlier. He presented. He asked me how I thought he did, and I told him I thought he cursed too much. And he gave me back statistics, which basically said that if a present if a presenter curses, they get more attention. So I just thought of, I thought I'd start off by saying piss shit fuck just to start it off. Okay, right on. There you go. Um, whoa. Okay, where to start? That's why. I'm, just a couple of things about me really quickly, so you know who's talking to you and sharing some information. Um, I have 25 years um, at American Express, MasterCard, Pepsi, and Microsoft, uh, developing all sorts of brands, uh, including lifestyle brands from Mountain Dew and Pepsi, and uh, Xbox and Microsoft. Um, so with 25 years of experience, uh, in 2011, when the I-502 law passed in Washington State, I left Microsoft to get into the cannabis industry, and uh, it's been 11 years now. During the course of 11 years, I've worked at Dope Magazine. I've developed a number of different uh, brands uh, that have uh, transcended different states. We've licensed those brands from California to Washington to Arizona to Oregon, and I should say those are cannabis brands. Um, and then uh, recently, I just launched my book, Branding Love and Commercialization of Cannabis, which for the last six weeks has been uh, the number one book in branding and logo design on Amazon as well as green business. So, uh, and that's not because I wrote a great book. That's really because the time is now. There's lots of momentum. States are opening up. Uh, people are getting used to both cannabis and CBD, and, uh, and that's why we're here. So I think the sales of the book really just show more about where we are in the industry and what's happening in the interest, certainly more so than, than my book. So that said, I mean, basically here, I'm here today to talk about creating a meaningful cannabis brand or CBD brand. So the first, so the first question is, what's meaningful? So what's meaningful is having meaning or having a serious, important, or useful quality or purpose and communicating something that's either implied um, and it might not be um, real. It might actually be perceived. So creating a meaningful brand is really important. That's obviously how we connect with consumers and, uh, and basically move forward and, and create something that's worthy of, of repeating. So a brand, it's really silly to almost go through the definition of a brand, but basically a brand is a promise. And, and it's the ability to continually and consistently uh, deliver that promise. And in delivering that promise, that promise can either be real or perceived. So sometimes people buy things that might not add value, but they think it adds value. And in that, there is value added. Uh, so I basically have, uh, I have an equation today, which is, uh, which is a little real. Um, in terms of uh, what it takes and what are the components. So I called in the four pillars of, uh, of branding and creating a meaningful brand. So there's a consumer type, there's a need state, there's a form factor, there's a brand archetype, and when you add those all up, that's what creates a meaningful brand. So that said, let's just go through those. So what's a consumer type? Right, a consumer type can be anything from the psychographics to the demographics to really learning about who the consumer is, what their needs are, and what they look for in a brand. Now, many people and many different uh, research companies are calling them different but consumers, different types. I tend to sort of stick with poor, comfortable, curious, confused, neutral, and contra. And I look at those as concentric circles. So, you know, the core, and, and bear with me here, I'm talking a cross between CBD and cannabis, and I know sometimes those are exactly the same, and sometimes those are totally different. So if I say some things that sort of seem uh, contradictory, that, that's why. But basically, I see these as concentric circles. There's the core in the middle. The core is everybody that 
let's just say, consumes on a regular basis, that fully understands it, that um, is engaged with it, might be in the industry. Um, that's the core. The comfortable are either those that work with them, live with them, participate with them, maybe hang out with them, maybe they're the weekend warriors. They consume every so often, but nonetheless, they're comfortable with it. The CBD Curious is uh, another group and sort of spans a really big gamut. Um, but really what they're about is they're interested. In they're looking for alternatives to pharma. They're, they're looking for other ways to basically either enhance their life or alleviate pain. Um, the kind of, the kind of confused or CBD confused, there's plenty of those out there. I think, I think the majority probably fall into that category, which they really don't know if CBD gets them high or not. They're just really not sure and they're not willing to sort of step into that, that Role. And they're also not really willing to sort of learn more and be proactive about learning more. So there's also the Canada Neutral. The Canada Neutral just doesn't care about it. And then there's the Canada Contra or CBD Contra. And those are the folks that are just against it. So what that helps me do, and by delivering basically the segmentation of consumers, it helps me sort of understand who am I talking to. If I'm talking to the poor, I don't really have to educate them. I have to talk to them more about the benefits. If I'm talking to others, like the kind of curious, the tone of the message is really more about educating. And if I can educate them and pull them into the comfortable or the core, then I think we, we start to get to a place where we're having real conversations. But essentially, there's people who just want to dip their toe in the pool and not jump in. There are other people in the deep end that are jumping in, and we sort of have to you know, pull all these people together as we create brands to talk to them in ways that are meaningful to them. Uh, also too, as I said earlier, there's so many different companies out now with data. Uh, there's Headset, BDS Analytics, uh, New Frontier Data, and they have different categories as well. So it's everything from the experienced CBD acceptor to the unconvinced dabbler, the isolated believer, the hesitant moderate, and really the enthusiastic high spender. And it, it, depending on who the, who the research firm is, they have different names, but essentially they're all moving at the same place and at the same time in terms of uh, where consumers are, how do we talk to them, how do we speak to them, how do we learn from them, how do we share information with them. So that's consumer type. The next thing is need state. So a need state is really when a consumer uh, consumes, right? So. So there's a few things that I try to look at in, in that area. The first thing is really, is it subtractive or additive? So when you think about that, it's sort of like, is this CBD product or cannabis product taking something away from my life or is it adding something to my life? So if it's subtractive, it means it's alleviating pain or it's doing something like that. Um, if it's additive, it's more aspirational. It's more about, hey, this thing is gonna get me to a place that I wanna go or make me feel a certain way or enhance a certain experience. And so in that, you know, there are really two different approaches. Uh, one might be more medical, if it's subtractive and alleviating pain or has specific benefits. Um, and the other additive is more aspirational, which is probably an adult use brand or, um, or a recreational brand depending on what you like to call it, because some people are all, all about recreational others or about adult use. Then, then we start to talk about um, specifically discrete and indiscreet form factors. So there's different types of consumers, and in that, some, uh, some may consume during the day, go out at lunch, and smoke a joint during lunch. They'll come back smelling like weed, for sure, or I should also say, perhaps smoking hemp flour. So there's different reasons why people want to smoke either hemp flower or cannabis. It's the fastest uptake. Um, and there's history and there's ritual and all sorts of things. But there's other folks that are using sublingual slips or transdermal patches, um, either for, <clears throat> for microdosing or, or for, for basically um, you know, bioavailability all day long. So in the discretion and the, and the non-discreet, you know, there's do I smoke and do I smell like cannabis? Or do I use a tincture, do I use a sublingual slip, or a transdermal patch, or do I vape? Those are the types of things. And that's part of someone's ritual as well in, in consumption. And then when you really sort of dig into rituals, it's sort of, is it rolling a joint, perhaps? Is it taking a tincture before you go to sleep? Is it whatever it is? Is it, uh, you know, 
wait in vain. You know, you get your cup of coffee and your bong and, and you're on for the day. It just depends on whatever it is, but everybody typically falls into a certain type of ritual pattern uh, as they consume either cannabis or CBD. So form factors. Um, form factor is really interesting. I mean, basically runs the gamut from flour uh, as, as flour and then anything else that could basically be uh, processed along the way. So, you know, that, that goes from flour to pre-rolls to tinctures to capsules, edibles, beverages, um, sublingual slips, transdermal patches, topicals, um, and again, it just depends, you know, how you use these and when you use these. So, you might use a, a topical, maybe pre-workout or post-workout, but those are the types of rituals that we're trying to get at. So, essentially, moving now to pillar four, the brand archetype. And um, the brand archetypes are really, over the course of 11 years, um, sorry about that, over the course of 11 years, and spending time in the cannabis industry and CBD industry, what's been really clear to me is there's 14 buckets. Not that there can't be more buckets or archetypes as I call them, but there's 14 brand archetypes. And the 14 brand archetypes are not mutually exclusive, they can overlap, but at the end of almost any given um, walk of a trade show or overlooking any brands, they pretty much come down to this. And I'll go through this in a minute. But it's health and wellness, counterculture, charity or cause, prohibition, sorry, art and design, prohibition, cultivator, nostalgia, regional, uh, celebrity, novelty, gender, foodie, luxury, and, and value. And um, again, those things are not mutually exclusive. So let's just take a brand like um, Whoopi and Maya. Whoopi Goldberg, so she's the celebrity component of it. Um, the brand specifically uh, focus, focuses on women's um, issues, like um, women's issues, I'll just leave it like that. I don't have to go down a list. Um, but basically, uh, that's where they focus. So, and they also have a charity component. So with that, there's a celebrity, there's a charity component to the brand, and then there's also the, the gender uh, component. And so, when you start to really, and I should also say, the one thing I skipped over is, a brand archetype is really a shortcut. Um, a brand archetype is something that you can look and you know what it is. It's almost like a music genre. You can. You don't even have to know who you're listening to, but you know it's jazz, and you know if you like it or not. You know it's country and western, and you know if you like it or not. You know it's rap and hip hop, and you either like it or you don't like it. Um, you don't have to know the song, you don't have to know um, you, you know, the, the performer, but what you do know is you don't like it, or that it resonates with you. And so that's what brand archetypes are. They're a shortcut which basically bring you to something, and that's tied to color and font, um, and all sorts of other things that basically bring you to an immediate response. This brand is speaking to me or this brand is not speaking to me. So when you, when you think about it, um, it's really these pillars. Um, and even though it's an equation which just seems so like one plus one equals two that there's a right answer, there's so many answers that can come out of all these metrics. But if you don't know your consumer, and you don't know their need state and their rituals and how they consume, and you don't know what form factor they consume, then you can't really sort of pull it all together and create a meaningful brand. So let me just go through a couple of uh, brand archetypes quickly. Um, so we we'll start up with counterculture brands. I mean, basically the counterculture, uh, almost by definition, any, any cannabis brand or CBD is probably a counterculture brand. But there's more counterculture brands than others. Um, Elevated is probably a great example. Uh, you know, and counterculture brands play a role. And let me just give you a quick story. Um, so there's a skateboard park, and there's a group of kids that are skating. And one, and this is a stereotypical story, right? So one kid rolls up on a skateboard, pulls out a joint, they light it up, they smoke the joint. Smoke walks across the park to the mothers that are pushing their kids on the swings. The mothers basically say, oh, those kids, boy, can curse because that gets attention. Those fucking kids. And uh, they look across the, at the kids. The kids look back and they're like, screw you, moms. And that's what kids do when they're 16 and they're skateboarding and they smoke weed, right? So it's part of what they do. 
Now, if you were to just change a form factor in that scenario, let's say something will slips or transdermal patches, could you imagine the kid rolling up to the skateboard park and saying, hey, check out these patches I got, hands a band-aid to everybody, and they all slap it on their arm, and they're like, all right, this will be good in about 45 minutes when, I'm, when I start to feel it. But that's not part of their lifestyle. That's not what they do. They don't put patches on. They smoke weed and blow it over to the moms to piss the moms off. And so that's, you know, just one quick example of how form factor plays into lifestyle and, and how that, that really comes together. Um, so that's uh, counterculture. Nostalgic is another brand. Uh, and nostalgia seems, the nostalgia brands seem to be coming and coming more and more. Um, they typically appeal to older uh, folks, just because I guess the older you get, the more memories you have and you sort of look back. Um, but nostalgia brands, you know, for example, um, uh, Vacation right now in California would be a really good nostalgia brand. Uh, there's some other, um, Dad Grass is, is another brand right now um, that's sort of nostalgic and looking back. Um, a novelty brand, a uh, novelty brand is basically using novelty to sort of, you know, catch somebody's eye. So Evergreen Herbal in Washington State uh, created impeachments uh, during the last couple of years. They were infused cannabis uh, mints uh, with a picture of President, former President Trump on, on the cover. Um, and uh, in this case, they were not only um, lucky because they launched the product once and sold through it, but they were able to bring it back again during the four-year period, so that was kind of funny. Um, you know, something else might be a brand like Firetruck. Um, Firetruck is based up in Washington as well. Uh, all their graphics are basically the letters Firetruck spelled out, with a Firetruck blocking most of the letters with the exception of F-U-C-K. So there's always a fuck on every package. There you go, I'm cursing, getting everyone's attention. Uh, so there's a fuck on every package, and it just stands out across the shelf. Uh, a foodie brand. Food is pretty self-explanatory. I think there was a big food movement over the last, let's say, decade. And that has continued into the cannabis space. Anyone that's sort of discerning about what uh, ingredients are in their products and, and um, you know, where they come from, the food to table or farm to table um, approach, you know, has definitely transferred into the cannabis industry. Regional is something that's really big right now, especially in California, um, as people compare it to champagne or cognac in France, and basically how that sort of uh, transferred into the Emerald Triangle uh, with some of the, um, you know, some of the flower coming from the different ter terroirs and Appalachians and basically harking back. Right now, Lowell in California has a collection of regional uh, cannabis flower, um, you know, coming from different uh, different regions and Appalachians within California, calling out the differences in, in the soil and the sun and the nutrients. Um, health and wellness, which I think plays really big, obviously, into the CBD category. Um, you know, health and wellness is just a different approach. Uh, you know, it's more about dosing, it's more about ingredients, it's more about, um, you know, ritual and, um, and a repetitive ritual than it is about getting high or, or, or fucked up. Well, I'm cursing more than I've done ever before. Um, <laughs> Uh, a celebrity brand. Some of you have heard of celebrity brands, right? Um, probably the most overrated category in my opinion. I'm not a fan of celebrity brands. Um, I just think uh, celebrities should smoke weed just like everybody else or consume CBD just like everybody else. Um, and, uh, and maybe endorse things, but, but building brands around celebrities is just a, a dangerous strategy from my perspective. Um, Really, prohibition is another. Uh, obviously, there's been uh, ties between prohibition and, um, and cannabis and CBD. I think Lowell is a great California brand that talks about um, prohibition. Uh, in Washington, there's a flower brand called Proof. And uh, if you know the, the small little shot bottles that come on airplanes, when, when I think they actually serve alcohol on airplanes, I don't know if they do that anymore. But, um, but basically, they would take joints and put it into the bottle and then the idea was proof, and this was just a, you know, a hearkening back to prohibition um, and what's taken place over the years. Art and design. Uh, art and design is, is a great category and, and really used well, I think, in, in cannabis and CBD. 
there's a great brand um, out of Seattle called Saints Joints, and basically what they do is they create pre-rolls, and those pre-rolls come in boxes. Those boxes um, are created by artists, and they come in limited edition. So more often than not, those, those pre-roll boxes are sold out before they even uh, end up in any of the dispensaries or the adult stores, and that's because they're now collectibles. So uh, the owner has really created the ability for people to collect and sort of this this demand or desire for his products, not only because of the flour that's in his pre-rolls, but because of the packaging that they come in. Um, so that's that's really interesting. Gender-based, um, gender-based has been, become uh, really big, especially this month uh, for Gay Pride. It seems like many of the brands that weren't gay last month all of a sudden are gay this month. Um, you know, and uh, and a friend of mine told me that's gay baiting when when you actually start to use things, rainbow colors and start to use things that uh, that pull people in uh, when maybe you're not necessarily from that community. So I think it's really important uh, during this month for brands to be really mindful about are they really part of a community uh, or are they leveraging all of the, the uh, for lack of a better word, the baggage and all of the, the accessories that a community uses to promote a brand. And I think that can backfire really quickly. Um, so uh, so Gender is uh, a great brand to talk about this month. Value brands is, are really important. I mean, value brands are essentially buy more, pay less. Um, that wasn't really the case prior to the pandemic. And so there have been a lot of value brands that have come out over the last year. And that's pretty much based on um, people not going out to the, all that much over the last year, or people people willing to basically um, you know work uh, to go to the store, not deal with people, purchase more, and bring it home. Um, so cultivator brand, cultivator brand is basically uh, Sherbinsky, let's say, uh, or or one of those brands where um, there's a long history of cultivation, uh, and those brands tend to be flower only brands. Um, Luxury, a great brand, um, again, out of, out of Seattle, is called Lyric Canagars. Lyric Canagars um, has created this amazing product, which is basically a cannabis cigar that they plate either gold or platinum, and they sell for $15,000 a cigar. And people fly up uh, to Boeing Field and pick up a number of these, and then they're off to Vegas to, to show everybody that they've got a $15,000 Canagar. But um, if someone told me their business plan was to build a platinum plated Canagor and sell it for $15,000, I'd tell them they were crazy. And yet, <clears throat> it's working for them. And uh, you know, they were on Vice, uh, Vice's most expensivest, and uh, it's working. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, lastly, Charity. Um, charity brand is uh, you know, pretty obvious, especially now many brands have a charitable component. Um, there's a couple of brands right now out of California. One is called uh, The Farmer and the Felon, which gives a portion of their proceeds back um, for expungement and for social equality. Um, and uh, there's also a company called Evidence. And if those folks haven't heard of Evidence, you should check it out because their packaging is literally built on what the police would take as their evidence bag and put your drugs into it, and now they actually take those bags and that's what they sell it back to consumers. So it's it's pretty awesome in the way that they've, they've sort of thrown it back into, into the face of, uh, of those they need to, quite frankly. Uh, so those are, the, um, those are the 14 cannabis brands. So just to add it all up and wind it all up, so the consumer type is really important. Without the consumer type, you don't know who you're talking to. The need state is how they consume, when they consume, what their rituals are. Um, so you're talking to them along those lines. The form factor, again, whether it's flour, sublingual slips, transdermal patches, tinctures, capsules, whatever it is uh, that makes somebody consume when they consume and how they consume. And then really the brand archetype. When you add those all up, we have a meaningful, uh, meaningful brand. Um, so that said, um, you can reach me. Uh, at, on Instagram at brandingbud or brandingbud.com, which is my website, and you can check out my book there if you're interested. Uh, and you can email me at david at brandingbud.com. Um, I'll take a question or two if there's a minute. Uh, yeah.
door in one sec. Oh, today. Um. <laughs> Thanks so much for the information. Um, I want to know if we can buy that book from you autographed today, if it's available. That's my only book I have, but you can buy it right now on Amazon.com. <laughs> Sorry. Any, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Yes, I'll sign your chest. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.